All right, we'll get started anyway. There's 16 of us here, 17 including me. I'm with you guys, 17. Uh, I don't know where everybody's at. Maybe a uh, pretty day or hung over from yesterday. I don't know. I'd bet to that probably. Speaking of machine elements, I actually enjoyed yesterday. I took my daughter to Holiday World. We try to go to the music park at least once a year. And uh, I love going to amusement parks because I don't get sick riding them sometimes. I'm more sensitive <laughs> now than I used to be. Uh, but there's all kinds of machine elements all over the place. Perfect for this class. Next time you go, you can look and see. My daughter rides the Revolution. I used to ride it with her. And it's this basically spin dryer. <laughs> but you don't just spin dry. You're not just on this thing rotating. It lifts up in the air and so you're going around like this. Uh, Anyway, it's, it was interesting. I stood off to the side this time and watched the arm lift. It was neat to look at all the internals and how it worked. It was driven off of an electric motor. The, the electric motor just drove a hydraulic pump. Of course, we're not talking about an electric motor. We're talking about an electric motor this big around and this long, you know. Drove a big hydraulic pump. The whole thing was hydraulics. You could hear the hydraulic motor that actually spun the thing. And then, of course, there were hydraulic lifts that lifted the arm and so on. Uh, I, don't, I couldn't see anything about the control system, but uh, anyway, it looked neat. If you ever get the chance to go to an amusement park, it's neat to look around at the mechanics of how the things work. So yeah, I sometimes look neat. at them while I'm riding the ride and stuff. What's that? I sometimes look at like the I do too. I try to see the structural components <laughs> and everything as I'm riding. Yeah. In fact, I was riding one they called the Scarecrow Scrambler. My daughter and I will ride that together. It's this, this uh, I don't know how to describe it. It's basically there are three sections and the whole machine is turning, but each individual section has three carts, I think, out from each other. Three, four carts out from each other. One of them fair puke rides. Yeah, exactly. And it spins, so you're spinning like this while you're spinning around, you know. And it basically is it's kind of, I guess, what a spirograph pin feels like, if you guys ever played a spirograph. It's about how, you know, your motion is, is similar to. So I was looking at it, trying to figure out how the, the cart on each arm turns around, the, the group of four carts. And it was neat because there was actually a shaft that came from the center of the, the main spinning. Uh, here, hang on. <laughs> I did find myself uh, this weekend at the gym just staring at like the really large, expensive like power rack they have, and yeah. looking at all the different weld lines and all the fasteners everywhere. Like, it's like, man, I don't know why I'm doing this. Well, we're just, starting to affect your brain. Yeah. <laughs> Right. Yeah, this is what it looks like. There we go. All right. So basically, you got four carts on each of these points, and those carts spin around an axis here while the whole thing spins around a central axis. There are shafts. I noticed there's a shaft running out each of the arms at the bottom. There's actually what's called a bevel gear down at the bottom. You can't see it, but where this arm connects, there's a bevel gear, and another shaft that runs up this way so that each of these four carts can spin around at this point on the arm. So anyway, it was a lot of fun. I enjoyed it. Um, you see a better picture. Here, there's a better picture there. Just, you can see the four carts off. Like I said, there's a shaft coming out here, and then you can actually see the bottom of part of the gear here. Must be bearings at either end to support it. And uh, I'm sure that these members are under tension, don't you think? Yeah. Right? Because you notice that these arms are pivoted here and here. So the whole thing can move like this. It's interesting that they used a four bar mechanism here, but we'll get into that later. Uh, and then these are supports going out here. So anyway, I thought it was me. I wonder what would happen if everyone rode on one arm. That might not be good. I always try to balance out rides when I get on, because I don't want you to read the newspaper tomorrow about me dying in holiday. Right? Well, if you notice, that's what the um, people who tell you to get on, they tell you to get on. That sometimes they, they do try to have you balance the ride. My daughter wanted to ride the hollow swings at the end. I don't know if you guys know, it's just swings that go up in the air and you go around. And I noticed this guy was in a hurry because he didn't bother balancing a little. Pretty much everyone was on one side. You hear those machine going, you know, the frequency going up and down as it went around. And it was, I thought, hmm, I'm not sure. I wish my daughter hadn't wrote it, and I'm glad I didn't. Uh, well, I've got some good news and some bad news. I don't know, I guess it depends on how you look at it. It's all just one piece of information. No one posted anything to the discussion. I guess what that means, except for me. I've posted my brainstorming. I guess that means you guys don't care. So I'm going to make an executive decision at this point, and we're going to go with the precious, precious plastics. Because I'm excited about it, and I want to do that project. So we're going to go with that. 
but you still have some freedom. In fact, the freedom is what do you want to make out of plastic? And so here are some really simple ideas that I've got. Uh, if you guys know me, I'm kind of weird in many ways. One of the things I do is I drink directly from two liter bottles. <laughs> and I don't drink sugary Cokes, I drink zero calorie and caffeine free because I found that caffeine gives me headaches when I stop drinking it. So it's basically water. The things that might kill me are the sodium benzoate and the aspartame. The aspartame is just going to make me more forgetful, so you probably won't notice. And then sodium benzoate supposedly won't hurt me unless there's extremely high quantities. So basically I'm drinking water. At least that's what I keep telling myself. So I need a handle because it's kind of a pain to hold these two liters. So I thought, well, we can make handles. That would be cool. So that's one of my ideas. Of course, I've bought some of these. These don't work very well for my daughter's hair. The style that I need, I'll bring in. I'm going to make dimensions of it. And that'll be part of my own personal project. I'm, we've got to come up with a couple of basic components. For example, we'll have to have a machine for chopping up plastic because we're going to recycle plastic. So we have to have a grinder, essentially. We have to have an injection molding machine because so many parts are injection molded. That just makes sense. Beyond that, I'm not sure what else, what other machines we'll need. And it will depend on what type of product you want to make. As I was looking around, I also saw this interesting device where you screw the two liter in. You have your own little fountain you can open up to those people. So these are just the ideas. Anybody ever seen these before? <coughs> I, was ha I happened to be in Hobby Lobby when I saw some of these. They're basically two two liter can lids put together back to back. So you can put liquid in one, turn it over, and it's, it's kind of like a, a hourglass, except the purpose of this is you usually put liquid in one side and you can make it a tornado. It's supposed to be a science-y thing probably for you know middle school and uh, elementary school. But I thought it was neat anyway. Since I got plenty of two-liter bottles, I thought that would be kind of cool. And I thought it might be neat to make a modification of this, add a tap off to the side where you could actually pressurize this because once you get to 320, we explode some of these bottles. Maybe I'd do it at 220. I, yeah, I guess the aspartame is kicking in. <laughs> So anyway, those are some of my ideas. So you still have some freedom to brainstorm and decide exactly what kind of plastic product you want to make, which might help guide what machine you're going to make. So you've got two goals. You've got to make a machine, then you've got to make a part with it of some type. Now, you can't just make the machine and say you're done. The, the machine has to produce something. Does that make sense? Okay. So that's, that's where your freedom still lies. I thought we'd start off, first of all, uh, in the slides, I'll go through the rest of the slides, and then what I'll do is I will put the teams together, and you guys can take a few minutes and brainstorm about exactly what machine you want to build based on what product you want to make. So it'll be a plastic product of some kind, uh, but that'll be up to you what product you want to make. <clears throat> okay. We were talking about, sh speaking of shafts on Scarecrow Scramblers, I know that there's a lot of shafts around. Do you need shaft? What, what is, why do we use shafts? Why bother? In fact, I had an experience over the summer. I did a lot of mechanic work over the summer on my car, my truck, and my backhoe. In fact, I replaced some shafts in my car. I replaced my front, right, CV drive, axle joint, whatever you call it. The CV is a joint. It's a constant velocity joint. The axle itself is like a drive shaft. I don't know what the whole assembly is called, but basically it was the right-hand side. And the reason I did that is because I got up under my car, and I saw that the boot, have you guys seen a CV boot? You know what that looks like? There's a couple different ways, and we'll talk about this later, but we'll talk about it in context now, I guess. The real name is Cardian Joint. <coughs> and they look like this. Uh, if you use them on your socket wrench set, <coughs> uh, you might call it a, a wiggly joint. At least that's what we call it when I grew up. I don't know any other name for it. Universal joint is the name you usually call it if you're talking about a drive shaft. Typically, drive shafts will have two universal joints, and there's a reason for that. I'll explain what that is later. Okay, so if you've ever, especially on a pickup truck <clears throat> where the shaft runs to the back wheels, you'll see these if you get down and look underneath it. Uh, a lot of times what will happen if you, you're having trouble, you put it in gear and there's this clunk before your vehicle takes off. It can be looseness in these joints, and sometimes you've got to replace them. Basically, there are needle bearings in each one of those to transmit power. But the idea is that the shaft can be misaligned. You can have angular misalignment. If you have two of them, then two shafts can actually have offset misalignment. So anyway, uh, the classic mechanical engineering name is a cardian joint. Uh, and that's, but that's not the only way uh, 
allowing two shafts to have different angles. There's also CV joints. And the problem with the cardian joint is that the intermediate shaft does not rotate at a constant speed. It actually increases speed and slows down. That's not a very good picture of what I want. A constant velocity joint solves this problem. Uh, and basically the, yeah, here's a typical CV axle, although it's not very large. Let's zoom in a little bit. It solves this problem where the intermediate shaft actually rotates at the exact same speed all the time as the, the other shafts. Okay, so there's no, uh, the, the, a universal joint can, or a cardian joint can induce vibration because of the oscillation. So this is a solution to that problem, especially where there's going to be typically very large expected angular misalignments because you're going to turn your wheels. You can't just go straight. Okay. So this is the front drive shaft on a front, <clears throat> front wheel drive car. And these CV joints are covered by what's called a boot. And then the boot is made of rubber. Of course, it degrades over time. And then the, the grease can leak out of here. And then you no longer have a CV joint. You need you know, a part that needs to be replaced. So I replaced mine over the summer because I noticed the boot was uh, going bad. I looked at the price. The, the problem is these boots, you've got to take the whole shaft off to slip the boot on. There used to be something that was called a split boot that you could buy where the, the boot that's around this rubber part was actually split. And so you could fold it around and you either glued it or you had some mechanical fastener that held it in place. I guess those didn't work very well because you can't hardly find them anymore. Especially for the, well, of course for the size that I have on my car. And so I had to buy the whole axle. I expected to pay about $20 or so, $30 at most for the boot. I got the axle for about 60, so I figured I was doing okay. Figured probably the other boot was going to go out pretty soon anyway, so why not just replace the whole axle? So anyway, drive shafts. Well, why do we use drive shafts? Transmit power. Transmit power. That's the whole point of the shaft, is to transmit power, right? Now you said transmit power. That was a good answer. You didn't just say transmit torque. Sometimes you want to transmit torque, but if you have a, a, a rotational speed, then your purpose is to transmit power. Okay. All right. So there's a, an ex, that's what I was looking for before, for the exploded view of the uh, constant velocity joint. Looks a lot like a ball bearing, but it's, there's actually, the, the balls are used to transmit power, but also to allow the, the misalignment. All right, the shape here is also very important, but we won't go into all that. We're not gonna study these in this class, just I'll mention them. The common problem is that the boot tears and you gotta fix it. So um, I will tell you, this is not official mechanic advice, but from my own experience, you can run with a split boot like, or a broken boot like this for quite a while and be okay. It's going to break anyway, so it's not the end of the world. Although, uh, the new shaft that I put on my car, uh, it's really weird. It has a resonant frequency at exactly 55 miles an hour. There's one before, but it's not as bad. But I can feel it in my pedal. It's just very slight. And I think the reason is because we were talking about resonant frequencies of shafts last time. Well, I think the reason, I, I compared the diameter of the shaft itself on the OEM unit that was original from the factory in my car to the one that I got from the, the auto part shop. The one from the auto part shop, shop is noticeably smaller in diameter. It's not as large. It's not as thick. What would that do to the resonant frequency of the shaft? But what would it do to the stiffness of the shaft? It would decrease the stiffness, which would decrease the resonant frequency. So I'm not really surprised. There are actually dampers you can get to put on these. Some of them come with dampers. They're rubber pieces that go around uh, the shaft and help to uh, dampen out those oscillations. But anyway, if you've seen my car, you know why I'm not worried about it. A slight vibration pedal's not going to affect me. There's plenty of other things that the car needs. All right, so anyway, what are the effects of machine elements on a shaft? Well, machine elements apply loads to shafts generally. And so, for example, it's common in industrial shafts to have gears riding on the shaft. Now, if we could, were to consider a gear pair, okay, so gear A and gear B, where, let's see, this is set enough, gear A drives gear B. So gear A is pushing on gear B, then the force on gear B is in this direction, right? So the rotation is clockwise for gear A, counterclockwise for gear B. A is pushing B, so A is pushing B to the left to make B rotate counterclockwise. That would be a force. We'll learn about that in more detail later. Another thing we're going to learn when we get to gears, which is near the end of the course, 
is that the shape of the teeth make a difference. And there's a standard shape called an involute profile of, of the gear teeth. And what happens, a, a side effect of the involute profile is that there is a radial load as well. And we'll explain why that's important later to have the, um, the involute profile and that this radial load is something we don't want, but we have to put up with because the advantage of the involute profile is too great. Okay, we're going to keep it. So not only is there this load from gear A on gear B to make gear B turn, there's also a radial load that tends to push gear A and gear B apart. Okay? So that's something that the shaft has to support. The shaft has to resist both of these loads. And uh, typically, and well, in every gear I've ever seen, the tangential load is larger than the radial load. And in fact, quite a bit. Anyway, now not like orders of magnitude difference, but bless you. But you know, two, three, four times usually. Anyway, um, so we've got two forces acting on gear B. Well, if we don't do anything, if the shaft doesn't support gear B, gear B is going to accelerate this way and this way, right? Because if you have unmatched forces, you're going to cause acceleration. Well, essentially, if this gear is to stay in place, then we have to apply an equal and opposite force to gear B. So the shaft has to apply a force upward equal to WR downward, which gear A is applying. The shaft has to apply upward. And the shaft has to apply a load WT equal and opposite to WT from gear A on gear B. Now you'll notice that the two loads, the radial loads, go through each other. They're on the same line. But the tangential load and the supporting reaction load are not on the same line. And so there's a couple, there's a moment here. And that's, of course, the whole point of the gear in the first place is so that you can uh, generate a force couple and cause rotational motion. That's the point. But also, there's a shaft supporting gear A. And in that sense, gear B is pushing on gear A. Gear B is pushing up in the radial direction on gear A. Again, trying to make the two gears go out of mesh with each other. Gear A also experiences resistance from gear B that appears as a load like this at the teeth in the opposite direction. Right. So even though A is managing to turn clockwise, it has resistance from gear B because we're transmitting power through these gears. And that's all well and good, and we'll learn more about these loads and how they affect the gears themselves. But what we're interested in is the fact both the shafts that support gear A and gear B have to resist these loads. They have to apply equal and opposite loads uh, to the gear to prevent the gears from accelerating away and out of mesh. Now, here's some stuff that we will get to a little bit later when we talk about gears. But for now, we're going to need these equations so that we can calculate the magnitude of the loads that are applied to the shaft. Because if you notice, the magnitude of the loads on the shafts are exactly the radial load and the tangential load, right? Equal and opposite loads must be applied by the shaft on the gear. Therefore, these loads are essentially applied to the shaft. Does that make sense? So the shaft is going to see WR like this and WT like this. It will be exactly those magnitudes. So how do we calculate those magnitudes? Well, it's pretty straightforward. If you know the amount of torque, say on a gear, then you can calculate the tangential load by taking the diameter of two. In other words, torque equals radius times load, right? You've seen this before. If you want to calculate the magnitude of the moment, all you need is the moment arm and the magnitude of the force. And that's all this equation. So this is something you've seen before. But we can uh, rearrange it to solve for the tangential load. If we know how much torque there is being applied to the gear, then we can calculate the tangential load on the gear. Now, the involute profile, as I said, causes there to be a tangential component and a radial component which sum to a normal component. This normal component is always normal or perpendicular to the surface of the gear tooth. And because of the way the gear moves, that normal force is always at the same angle. It's one of the magic parts of the involute profile. Like I said, the part we're really interested in is this tangential piece because that's what tends to cause rotation and torque in the gear, and that's why we have the gear in the first place. But the radial load is also useful. So here's a way to relate the tangential load to the torque. Here's a way to relate the radial load to the tangential load. It turns out that this angle phi, which is called the pressure angle, is constant. It depends on what gear you buy. There are some common pressure angles. 14 and a half degrees is not used a whole lot anymore, but 22 and 25 degrees, I think it's 22. 20 degrees. And, yeah, 20 and 25 are used frequently now. So uh, this pressure angle will it's going to be 20 or 25 degrees for just about everything. But you have to know which it is. Okay? 
And so you can calculate the radial load from the tangential load if you know what kind of pressure angle you've got on the gears. That will just depend on the gears themselves. And then the normal load, the magnitude of the total load, can also be calculated from the tangential load. So here's some equations that are useful because in posing a problem, we'll say, well, this gear transmits a certain amount of torque. And guess what you're going to do with that? You're going to use that to calculate the tangential load. On it. So you can figure out the load that's being applied to the shaft, and then you use that tangential load to calculate the radial load, because the shaft also has to support the radial load. Does this make sense so far? So it's basically two forces we have to support uh, if we're talking about a spur gear. They are the radial load and the tangential load. I'm not going to go into this slide in a lot of detail. We'll get to it later. But not only are there what are called spur gears, and I'll pass them around since we're talking about gears. There we go. I have to be in this classroom. I don't always get to teach machine elements in this class. Here's a core abused spur gear. I'll show these to the camera because we've got a few people out. I think what happened is somebody cut this gear out and didn't know you had to have hard teeth and then ran it. I, I don't know where it came from, honestly. But anyway, this is a spur gear, and you know it's a spur gear because the teeth are straight with the axis of the gear. Okay? This is a helical gear because the teeth are at an angle to the axis of the gear. Okay, so I'll pass these around and let you guys look at them. Start that one in front and this one in the back. And so for spur gears, we'll end up with a radial load and a tangential load. But when you have a helix angle, when the teeth are at an angle, you also end up with an axial load, a load along the axis of the shaft. So if you have a shaft that runs this way and you're applying a load like this, you're going to need thrust bearings on that shaft to prevent it from moving. Does that make sense? Okay. So just know that helical gears have three loads, tangential, radial, and axial. And here's some equations. I think there's some equations. Yeah. Uh, WX is the axial load. Where is it on here? Here we go. WX is a tangential load multiplied by the tangent of Psi? Is it that psi? I don't remember. I think it's using psychology, so I'm pretty sure that's psi. Anyway, it's the helix angle. It's the angle that the teeth make with respect to the axis. <coughs> yeah, so there's the helix angle. So you need the helix angle, the pressure angle, and then you'll be able to get the four loads. Now understand, this normal force is really the vector sum of these other three. So it's not an independent. That's why I say there are three forces to be considered. Okay, the tangential, radial, and axial load on a helical gear. If you add them all together, then you get the true normal force. And here I do have the equation. So here's the equation. So not only do we have the same equations as we had for uh, spur gears to relate the tangential load to the torque, but now the radial load needs to be modified a little bit. We can't just use the tangential load and the tangent of the pressure angle. We have to include a division of cosine of the helix angle. In other words, the angle of the teeth on the gear. And then the axial load can be calculated, like I said, from the, the tangential load as well as the helix angle. Okay. So bevel gears and worm gears will also provide loads to shafts. For those equations, we can reference chapter 10. And we'll get into that in more detail. I'm not worried about that right now. We're trying to concentrate on the shafts instead. Okay. And I, one of the trade-offs I had to make in rearranging this course uh, years ago is the fact that I have to introduce some material about gears before I've taught you about gears. I used to bring up gears early on in the class. I teach belts and pulleys and then and chains and then um, uh, and and then immediately go into gears. And that's all well and good, but we didn't use all those things as much as shafts and fasteners and frames. So I rearranged the course. So another bit of information uh, is about belts and chains. Now on a chain, there's always a tight side and a slack side. So in this case. A, sprocket A, is the driving sprocket. It's the one where, say, the motor's hooked up or you're pedaling, okay? Maybe it's your, your drive sprocket on your bike. Whatever it is, it's the one pulling on the chain to make the other sprocket rotate, to make the driven sprocket rotate. In that case, there's a tight side and a slack side. Essentially, we assume that there is no tension in the slack side, which for a chain is a reasonable estimate. Okay? The tension in the slack side is very low by comparison to the tension in the tight side. So we just neglect the slack side. Essentially what happens is that this force in the chain, it's actually at an angle. Okay, so the force in the chain, if you have two different sides sprockets, is at an angle. How, how does that affect the shafts that the sprockets are riding on? 
Well, usually that angle phi is very, very small. Okay, a lot of times these two are close enough in size or far enough apart that that angle is small enough we can just neglect it and we'll just pretend that the force of the chain is directly applied to the shaft instead. That's close enough for just about everything you'll ever encounter. Now the magnitude of the force in the chain can be calculated <coughs> from the torque on either A or B divided by the radius of A or B, whichever one you're looking at. You'll see this more in context when I work through an example problem. But anyway, uh, the force in the chain uh, has to be supported. I mean, essentially, the shaft has to apply an equal and opposite force. And like I said, we assume it's just a horizontal force along the, the center line between the two chains equal to the force of the chain, the tension of the chain. Questions so far? Are we doing OK? Comments? Some of you are shaking your head yes as I talk. I assume you have some experience with this. If you do, please feel free to speak up. I'm interested in your experience and your thoughts. Well, anyway, um, if we continue on to belts, belts are very similar to chains in that they have a tack side and a slack side since one driving sheave or pulley is pulling on the other. Um, but the tension in the slack side is not negligible. Yes, sir. I actually do have a question about like, sure. chain sprockets. Yeah. How's like chain stretch work? I know if you have a weird number of teeth, like the less teeth you have, the more likely you're still going to have chain stretch over a long distance. Like, well, does the, like, the rotational angle of the gear, if you have one gear that's turned where the link is like pushing away, and then this gear is still turning and it's like driving something like better. Okay, it's sprocket, first of all, not gear, but. Yeah, sprocket. Yeah. It'll, it'll stretch the chain and call it the rattle. Yeah. Um, I always thought that it was the more teeth you had on the sprocket, the better off you were. Yeah, and, and that's the case. Like if you have like a like a square point in chain, okay, you get if you have a weird angle, if one's got the, like the yeah. this way and one's got the corner flat, right, it'll stretch the chain and cause a fat right. What, what you're pointing out is the fact that these are integer things, and as they come around, they may not be aligned perfectly, yeah. and so the chain has to stretch. Yeah, that's definitely a problem. Uh, I think another thing you can do. Uh, if I remember right, an odd number of teeth on the sprocket helps because you don't want this, the chains to come around exactly the same tooth every time. Okay. So you want, and I think that's more for even wear. But yeah, as far as chain stretch goes, I don't know a lot about it. I know that there's significant force in the chain. Another thing to notice about chains is that as you apply load to one side, right, to the links in one side, that side's going to eventually come around. It's going to be unstretched. So you've got, it's not fully reversed, but it is still a fatigue type load, and so chains don't last forever because of that. As far as stretching goes, um, we just had an issue with it at work, and we had to contact some people to get information on it because yeah. we designed the conveyor, and every time it come around, it jerked real hard. Right. And they said it was because we had a tooth that was pulling on the chain, right. and a tooth that was resisting the pull, and it was causing the whole thing to buckle if the chain didn't have much point in it. Right, the thought of, of two squares is a really good way to think about that and to understand what's going on there. You're yeah. right about that. Um, I suppose that both the machines have inertia, and so the chain has to give at some point. Yeah, all your machines not structurally sound enough, and that's what's flexing right. instead of the chain. Right. That's so what we had going on. Because we had the C channel on both sides of the flange is out, yeah. and every time it pull around, we had to join the center and pull up on it. Well, so did it end up stretching your chain or not? No, it didn't tear the chain up, but it was pulling the anchors out of the ground. Okay. We yeah. ended up having to take all that apart and get a different set of gears. And sure. Contact the uh, sprocket company. And so you can see there's certainly very high forces out there. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Which could certainly stretch a chain. Yeah, it's supposed to move wood stays, pallets of wood stays down line. Yeah. I've had a similar problem with my chainsaw, but I think it's my own fault. <laughs> my chains always stretch, and I think it's because I'm trying to make them do work. I have a locust on my property, and uh, I've cut down. If you know anything about locust, it's great firewood, but it's really hard. And it, it's uh, hard of woods. Yeah, and it'll, the problem with it is it's brittle, and during storms, it breaks pretty easily, especially when it's getting a large one. Well, I learned something else about it. They like to sucker like crazy, so the roots will send up all kinds of fresh baby uh, <laughs> trees. So I said, forget this. I, my house began to look like a haunted house and things were in such bad shape. So I cut down most of the locusts and used them for firewood and just mowed around and let the little baby trees grow wherever I wanted them. I've almost replaced the trees already. They grew so well. But 
I think the reason my chain on my chainsaw is stretching so much is not because steel designed the chainsaw wrong with the number of teeth on the sprockets, but because the wood pulls so hard on the chain that it up with high load. Because I, I try to keep my chains just as sharp as possible, but they dull very quickly with this locust. And uh, I think I end up not noticing and driving the chain through anyway because I want to get it done, you know, and I end up stretching my chain. So I think it's high load is what causes the chain to stretch. Yeah. Um, it, once we get to the chapter, uh, what is it, seven, I think, where we talk about chains, belts, and pulleys, uh, when we get to that point, there are uh, guidelines for specifying the size of the chain, given how much power has to be transmitted. Uh, and I don't know, I have to look at that and see if they're accommodating the chain stretch or not. But that's a good question to find out. But yeah, if you get any more information on the problem you had, I'd be interested in seeing it, especially how you make sure you've got the right number of teeth so you don't stretch the chain unnecessarily. It seems like more teeth would be better. Was that what yeah, you that said? Yeah, infinite amount of teeth, if you did like a theory on that, yeah. there, there would be no, There'd be no the chance distance of stretch would not be as bad. Right. And it, okay. it talks. It yeah, I should look bad. into that and include something about that, because that's a really good point. Well, we, had, we had like a 32-tooth year or something, or a sprocket, and it's, that's, it's weird. Big How many? Sprocket, big conveyor, and it scared us all when it sure. like that. Was it 32 on both sides, or was there a smaller one on the other side? The drive gear was bigger than the end gear. Okay, so you had two different sides. Yeah, it was, it was up speed. I imagine this would only be a problem when you've got two different numbers. Yeah, of that's teeth. what we found out. We yeah. ended up having to change the motor out, <coughs> put the gear motor out, or something like that. And yeah. change the sizes to get the speed we wanted. Yeah, interesting. Thank you for sharing. See all that experience in, in Richmond, of course, it helps us. So. There are things I've not thought about or that might not be in the book, so we can add that to it. Thank you. I'll try to remember it. But going on to belts, when you have a belt drive, they're friction drives. And so you have to have tension in both sides of the, the belt because as one side starts getting tighter, the other side will slack off a little bit because it's pulling harder. And so you, you have to have enough uh, tension on this side so that you still have good contact and good friction characteristics around both of the sheet okay, or pulleys. So there's a significant force in one side that is higher than the force in the other side of the belt. Okay. So in order to calculate that, how do you do it? Well, the problem is, this is kind of like a, a, statics in, well, a, a statically indeterminate problem where it depends, the force in the two sides of the belt depend on how far they've been pulled apart before you even turn the drive on. Okay. So there is a rule of thumb for tensioning belts and I can't remember that we'll get to it later on in the belts chapter. I think it's 150% of the running force. I, I can't remember right now. It doesn't matter. If you use that recommendation, then the tension in the belt uh, that you, uh, no, let's see. That's torque on the belt piece. Where's my tension? Wait, hang on, did I put it in? I did not. Hang on, let's find that because that's worth having. We'll run back to chapter uh, chapter seven and find it. It's in the belt section. And we're talking about V belts in in particular here, but this also applies to synchronous belts. Synchronous belts are a little bit different. They don't have to be tensioned as much. But uh, they talk about tensioning belts. It may actually be in the shaft chapter, but I don't, I didn't think so. Let's see. <coughs> Belt tension. I mentioned it there. I don't see it. I'll find it in the break and then I'll point it out. It, essentially, there's an equation that will allow you to calculate the force uh, in the belt on the slack side and the force in the uh, tight side. And so there's, if the belt is properly tensioned, then you can get at what these two forces are and then calculate the, the force from the belt. You just take, you just assume, again, because the angles are small, you just assume that the force from the belt acts along the center line and you just add the two together. So it's pretty straightforward. But understand the force in the belt depends on how much the belt is pre-tensioned. So I'll find that equation for you at the break and share it with you. I need to throw it on this slide because uh, it's important. But then that, the, those forces then are forces that the shafts themselves have to resist.
All right, now, flexible couplings. There are many different types of flexible couplings. I've already shown you two, constant velocity joints and cardian joints. But there are also uh, other types. So the, the idea is that these are things that transmit torque but do not apply uh, any bending or axial loads to the shaft. So the force from a chain or a belt or from a gear is going to apply a bending force to the shaft, especially if the thing is cantilevered. If it's straddled, it's still going to apply significant loads to it. Okay, now, what weakens a shaft? So there are loads applied to the shaft. What weakens a shaft? Well, anything you cut out of it, any stress concentrator is going to cause a weakening point in the shaft. There's a lot more to say than what we've got here, but here's a uh, profile key seat, uh, key seat and a what's called a sled runner key seat. And there's a lot to say about the radii and the size of the, the key versus the shaft. For our purposes, we're going to assume that any profile key seat has a stress concentration factor of 2 and any sled runner is 1.6. These are not the gospel truth. Okay, These are just in the ballpark so that we don't have to focus on sled runners and profile key seats and be worried about the radii at the root of these features as well as their size. Okay? These are reasonable for keys that are sized reasonably to the shaft. And we will get into keys as well. There's a, given a, a shaft diameter, there's a standard size key that goes in. You don't choose just any size you want. Okay? Um, but rather than going into a lot of detail about stress concentration factors, we'll just use those two. So this is worth writing down. <coughs> If you're writing down notes, also, if you're highlighting in addition or instead of, it's worth highlighting this in chapter 12. And this we do need to find. Oh, 458. 458. I just found what I was looking for for belts. Yeah, so page 458 under key seats, you might want to highlight those two numbers or commit them to memory or something. Because that's what we're going to use every time that we size a key. And I said I'd find it at the break, but here it is. On page 457, equation 1212 is the equation I was looking for back in chapter 7. If the belt is properly tensioned, which means, uh, here, it's in here somewhere. Uh, let's see. Oh, here we go. On, the, uh, on page 457, the upper right column, second paragraph, it says, to determine the bending force FB, a second equation involving the two forces F1 and F2 is needed. This is provided by assuming a ratio of the tight uh, side tension to the slack side tension. For V-belt drives, the ratio is normally taken to be F1 over, over F2 equals 5. And basically, that just represents a V-belt that has been tensioned properly. Okay. So that's where it comes from. And then the force in the belt that's going to be applied as a bending force to the shaft is given in equation 1212. So you may want to highlight equation 1212. I'll try to add it to my slides during the break so that it's there as well. And I'll reference the page number too. Um, but that was the equation I was looking for. Okay, shoulders also will cause stress concentrations. And so we're going to take uh, again, depending on the diameter of the, the step section and the large section and the diameter of the radius in the cut, all these things make a difference to the correct value of the stress concentration factor. But in the shafts chapter at least, most of the time we will assume that there are sharp shoulders and there are well-rounded shoulders. <coughs> What's the difference between the two? You tell me. I don't care. We'll call one. You, you think about it, if you want a square corner to go in, well, you're going to have to have a fairly sharp corner, right? But if you can afford a generous radius, then you'll have less stress concentration. So these are the two numbers we're going to use, 2.5 and, and one and a half. Those are on the facing page, page 459 in the upper right-hand column. So you may, if you're highlighting, you may want to highlight those as well. Now, there's more to be said here about this. If you guys ever noticed, especially on the bearings that I passed around, Ever notice that there's a chamfer on these? I'm going to pass this bearing around it's worth noting. And I'll hold it up to the camera, although I don't think you can see it. I'll just point out on this side of this bearing, there's it's not exactly square. There is a radius, but it's fairly small. It may be a maybe, I don't know, I'm guessing a 32nd of an inch. But on the other side, there's a fairly generous almost eighth inch 
uh, curve there, radius. Okay, so pass this around and note that on the uh, inner race. The reason for that is so that the bearing can be set against a shoulder, but the shoulder can be fairly generous, see, because the bearing is rounded off. So that's the purpose of that little, it, it can be a chamfer, it can be a, a radius, whatever, but uh, that way the bearing can still ride up against the shoulder and be located properly, but there's clearance so that it can fit and you don't have to put a very sharp corner in the shaft and end up with a huge dress tree. <coughs> Now, the ratio of the, the radius cut to the smaller diameter and the ratio of these two diameters does make a difference. And this is a particular example for a stress concentration factor of 2.5, where we have a very, fairly sharp radius, whereas this is a fairly well-rounded radius. Here you notice the radius to smaller diameter ratio is much higher. Okay, and we have the same small and large diameter ratio, but uh, Anyway, so that's where the, these two factors come from. So we will either call them sharp or well-rounded. There are also grooves that are made in shafts, and a lot of times these grooves serve a couple different purposes. Sometimes you put a groove in a shaft for an O-ring, for sealing purposes. Sometimes you put a groove in a shaft for a snap ring. How many people love snap rings? Anybody here love snap rings? Anybody ever don't know what we're talking about with a snap ring? Okay, well, I had to deal with snap rings recently. I've, I've done it. I don't think I would ever design anything with a snap ring unless I had a gun to my hand. I was forced to do it. Because okay, I've had to work with them and take them off of things. And they can be a real pain, especially when they're hard to get to. I replaced the clutch on a, an air conditioning compressor in one of my cars a few years back. And the clutch had, I think, literally three snap rings. One external you had to take off, and two internals you had to get to and get out of there. And they were just very difficult to get out. Of course, they went in okay, but they were hard to get out. This summer, I was working with my backhoe, and I think I told you guys, maybe with sprinkling materials I told you, I broke the foot off one of my backhoe stabilizers and had to weld it back onto the arm. Well, in doing that, you had to take a pin out, and that pin had snap rings on it. And of course, the person that had put it in had put it in behind where the tire blocked access to it. It was very difficult to get to, so of course, I turned around and put it in the right way, what I would call the right way from the serviceman's perspective, where you can get to the snap ring on the outside. But anyway, snap rings usually have fairly tight radii on the inside of the cut and so the stress concentration is fairly high so we're going to assume for any grooves like this that, that it applies a stress concentration factor of about three okay, and the purpose of grooves like this is to prevent axial motion along the length of the shaft of some element whether it's a bearing or a gear or whatever it is is to prevent axial motion along the shaft okay finally we get to our first equation when we go through all the effort of calculating all the loads that are applied to the shaft, given a design, once we come up with a design, and the stress concentration factors, then we can finally calculate the required diameter at that section of the shaft. This equation doesn't mean much to you yet, but it's really important. And students forget to use this equation because this is not the most important equation for shaft design. However, it is worth highlighting. Page 461, equation 1216, is an equation worth highlighting or writing down in your notes or putting in the front of the chapter even. Honestly, this is one of those equations that I think I'd make my own chapter summary. You go to the first page of this chapter and just write it down. It's worth it. So what does this equation say? Well, the 2.49 is conversion factors. Don't worry about that right now. Okay, it's just, con no, it's not conversion factors. It's geometry, but I don't remember where it comes from. It doesn't matter. What matters is this V is a shear load. It's, remember when we talked about uh, beams in strength of materials and we calculated shear loads in the beam. Well, this, this V is that shear load. It's going to be measured in, say, pounds, for example. Okay? Well, if you've got pounds of shear load, that load could be increased by some concentration factors. If there's a feature at that same point in the shaft, like a groove or something that gives us a stress concentration factor 3, we've got to include that in this equation. We also need a design factor in. Okay. And then we can calculate the required diameter. Well, almost. We need this SN prime. What the heck is SN prime? Well, this is a fatigue <coughs> strength. In fact, it's a modified fatigue strength. This is the one thing that we will have to go back to Chapter 5 to find. So if you are tabbing your book, you should tab this page. If you are not tabbing your book, you should still tab this page. Page 171 is the page that you need. Well, around 171 is what you need for dealing with or finding out SM prime. 
So 171, 172, 173 in that area is what we need for coming up with SN prime. SN prime is really just a strength, but it's not yield strength, it's not ultimate strength. It's how well the material will endure repeated cycling loads. Does that make sense? Okay, so it's a different thing than what we've had so far. Page 171 is the magic page that you need. It's about the only thing we're going to go back to chapters 1 through 6 for. So please put a tab there, and I've, I've got one. I just labeled mine SN. Just put that on. Okay. I'll show you how to use it in the context of an example problem. Okay. But you need to know that it's there and that it's worth putting now you can say, well, wait a second, why should we bother with some kind of fatigue strength? Why would we use yield or ultimate strength? What do you think? Why with the chef would we not yield, use the yield or ultimate strength directly? Because you're applying a constant, like cycling. Because we're applying cycling load. As the shaft rotates around, the direction of the forces applied change. Think about it. Let's go back. Let's go back to, say, gears, applying loads to shaft. It's easy to understand. As the shaft rotates, well, these two shafts are rotating, right? As they rotate, the gears don't move except the gears just rotate. And so the direction of the loads relative to the machine frame remains constant. But relative to the shaft, the shaft has to always apply a load like this. So as the shaft rotates, from the shaft's perspective, the load is turning around the shaft. Does that make sense? So to the shaft, this is a constant loading something like this, right? You're constantly trying, changing the direction of the load on the shaft, and therefore the shaft is being fatigued. So we have to compare, or we have to somehow accommodate the fact that this is a fatigue type load. And so you notice what we're doing is we're comparing, we're, we're calculating a ratio, and ratios are good for comparing, right? We're comparing load, to strength. We're just taking a ratio. That's all we're really doing in order to calculate a required diameter. Questions on that? Does that make sense? Probably doesn't make a whole lot of sense yet. I'm giving you a quick 20,000 foot view and then we'll go into the boring details in the example problem. Here's the really important equation. Go to, let's see, let's try going back to chapter 5. Let's go to chapter 12. Here's the equation students see as the big, really important equation of 99 times out of 100. This is the one that tells you, well, not 99 times out of 100, 9 times out of 10. This tells you how large the shaft has to be. So students focus on this equation and use it and then forget the simpler equation. Turns out that this equation will usually dominate near the middle of the shaft, whereas the other equation will dominate at the ends. So this equation will predict a larger diameter near the center of the shafts than the other one. But the other equation will predict or will require a larger diameter out at the ends of the shafts. So don't forget, we've got to use both. This is equation 1224. Now, there are some problems with this equation. Before we, but before we get into the problems, let me explain what this equation is doing. This equation is calculating a required diameter based on a safety factor, N, stress concentration factor, Kt, applied to the moment in the beam. You can think of these shafts as beams for right now. Remember how we drew shear and moment diagrams for beams? And at every point along the beam, you could tell what the moment was. Well, we've got to do the same thing for shafts. The shafts are going to behave like a beam, and we're going to have moments along the length of the beam. Well, that's the moment that goes in here. If you're trying to decide the diameter two inches down the shaft, plug in the moment two, two inches down the shaft, wherever that happens to be, and the torque at that point, and you can calculate the required diameter. But of course, the required diameter along the length of the shaft could vary a bit because the loads along the length of the shaft vary. Right? The, the shear and the moment will vary along the shaft. Now, you'll notice we've got stress concentration here, and we're essentially comparing the magnitude of the moment to the, the fatigue strength of the material. Whereas here, this is the torque in the shaft, and this is the yield strength. Why do you suppose we would compare the moment to a fatigue strength and the torque to a yield strength. Why would we do that? Why not compare both to a fatigue strength or both to a yield strength? Well, again, we've got some load that's tending to bend the shaft. 
Well, that's going to be a fully reversed bending, isn't it? Because in the next instant, the shaft's going to rotate. The bending load is still in the same direction, but the shaft is rotated. So again, the shaft sees a changing direction of moment load. Okay. So again, this moment load is a fatigue type load. However, the torque load, we assume, is essentially constant. Because we're assuming we're talking about a machine that is running at steady state. It's not a machine that is like in my backhoe, where all of a sudden a shaft that's transmitting power is loaded more heavily because I'm lifting a load of dirt. We're talking about, because we're trying to keep things simple, we're talking about a machine that is constantly applying a, a given amount of load. So the torque at any point along the shaft is constant, and there's no point in comparing it to a fatigue strain. What if you had wildly fluctuating torques? Then what would you do? Probably compare to the fatigue strain. Right? You'd modify this equation, you'd plug in S and prime here instead of SY and use it. Now, notice that this is a vector sum. That's basically what this bit is here. Square root of the sum of the squares. And there's a reason for this. It, it's because the direction of the stress and the shaft are perpendicular to one another. As a matter of fact, there can be other loads. The, if you try to include the shear load with the moment and torque load, it becomes very difficult. In fact, when I was studying engineering, studying mechanical engineering, we did this. We actually included all of them. But we went back to the basic strength of materials and looked for a critical point on the shaft and then calculated the actual stress there. Well, what happens is that the shear is usually small enough and not a, a very important amount, such that once you get a diameter here, you're going to get a diameter, say, you calculate out of it, 0.3592, okay? Are you going to specify on the print that the shaft needs to be 0.3592? No, you're going to put 0.4, right, and be done with it. Or you're going to put a half inch and be done with it. Well, usually there's enough extra, and especially with a, a design factor or safety factor, that including the shear is just not worth your time. Okay, the shear kind of comes along for the ride, and 99 times out of 100, it's going to be just fine. So this simplifies the analysis a lot because we only have two equations to calculate diameters from. We don't actually have to go back to strength materials, find a critical point on the shaft, and do a three director a three direction sum of vectors to calculate the stress at that critical point on the shaft. We can just use these equations and be okay. Right? So it makes our life a little bit easier. So this equation <coughs> is basically assuming that shear is not significant and that we've got relatively large moment and uh, torque loads. And that's usually the case in shafts. Usually the shear is not a significant contributor to, to failure of the shaft or to the loading of the shaft. Questions, comments? Okay, we did a really